Good morning, everyone. I'd like you to welcome uh, welcome you to our webinar uh, on uh, intellectual property in government procurement competitions. Um, we're very excited to host this uh, discussion, and uh, the uh, we've had a great response. Uh, it's a virtual who's who of um, government, industry, and academic experts on intellectual property, both here. Uh, on the webinar with you as well as um, among registrants. So we're, it, this is an issue that has been animating um, um, strongly in the last few years in, in government and industry and for a long time before that. I mean, intellectual property is the, um, is the secret sauce for companies and their success. Uh, and it also is important for government procurement officials to understand what intellectual property rights they need, what, um, uh, you know, what they don't need when they do um, procurement competitions or acquisition uh, um, efforts. And so this has been an effort that's been strong in this administration. They've, they've, they've launched a new intellectual property policy. And uh, we have uh, Mr. Richard Gray, who's, who directs that effort, the IP cadre within Office of State of Defense. Uh, and then we have three members of the, um, the 813 panel, which looked at, at take data rights again, from a government industry's perspective. Um, and um, so we're very excited to launch this conversation. But before we do that, um, I, I think, as I mentioned, I'm the executive director for the Center for Government Contracting here in the School of Business at George Mason University. Uh, and uh, what we are, our, our goal is to be a nexus for government and industry and academia to address the, the real challenges in the government contract community that, you, that we all deal with every day. Those are the business policy, regulatory issues, uh, facing us and then convening events like today to have a candid discussion and move the ball forward. We do this through three lines of effort around research, education and training, and then collaboration. And this today's is an uh, example, Jim uh, Hasek, who's our senior fellow uh, in the center has written a, a couple of white papers on intellectual property and uh, we'll talk about the most recent one. Uh, and then we're having an event around this topic today. Uh, and we're very excited to have um, this esteemed panel to address it. Um, and I also want to put a plug in for an upcoming event, um, which is our, um, our annual conference that we do with uh, Defense Acquisition University. And the theme for that conference is uh, this year is government contracting in a changed world. And it is like with all things virtual. Um, and we have the second module next Tuesday, November 10th. Um, and it's on, a, a, on COVID uh, acquisition and procurement in a, in a COVID changed world. And we have an exciting full lineup of panelists ranging from Stacey Cummings, who leads the Joint Acquisition Task Force, and other senior government officials from IRS, GSA, DOD, DHS, uh, and you name it, as well as senior executives, including the CEO of Circo North America, and a, a number of other senior industry um, and then academic professionals as well. So sign up for that at, um, at our website, that's uh, govcon.gmu.edu. And, and we'll look forward to, and we're also gonna be uh, tomorrow, today or tomorrow we'll be releasing a COVID report, which outlines kind of builds on the work we did uh, previous in the year, but looks at the federal response and the impact on the industry in detail. So we look forward to your feedback on that um, when we release that um, within the next 24 hours. But let's get back to the topic at hand and I'm gonna get out of the way and pass it over to uh, Jim. And I just wanna welcome uh, all of you on the, on the call as well as to our panelists. So Jim, over to you. Thank you, Jerry. Let me start by saying, I'm, I wanna echo what you said about uh, the, the folks we have on this call, 150 some odd people uh, signed up to hear us talk about intellectual property in, uh, you know, in the middle of a Wednesday. And uh, it's, that, that's pretty good for a topic that would be seemingly arcane to a lot of people. If we have that many folks interested, it's just a testament, I think, to the, the, the value that is at stake, both to government and to industry uh, within IP rights. You were saying, Jerry, that uh, this has been a topic that has been, uh, it's been, it's new, but it's also very old. Uh, I think the history of it goes back, uh, that is to say, the question of whether or not government the military should own the, uh, the uh, property rights to the intellectual property that underpins, you know, the fairly complex systems, often complex weapon systems supplies. That goes back to, to at least to the year 1900, when the U.S. Navy and the Royal Navy were, as I illustrated in a very book from a few years ago, uh, we're, we're, we're struggling with the idea of, you know, 
how much of the secret sauce behind the torpedoes, totally new weapon system they were trying to buy at the time, uh, they should actually own. Fortunately, we've got uh, we've got two things to work with. We've got a great panel of people we're going to talk to. Um, I am, I think, as you mentioned, a senior fellow here in the Center for Government Contracting in the School of Business at George Mason. Uh, we're going to be talking with, of course, first Richard Gray, who is the effectively the IP czar for the Defense Department, if that's a good way to put it, uh, and a member of the 813 panel, uh, the Government Industry Advisory Panel on Technical Data Rights. I'm just told that uh, if we're, I've been looking for the report. I'm told just now that it's available on the NDIA website. I'm going to grab that after the talk. Uh, Richard also teaches in the government contracting program uh, at another university named George, George Washington, uh, in, uh, I'll, we'll call them our crosstown rival across the river. Uh, we have Shay Assad, the former director of defense pricing at the Pentagon, who also ran uh, acquisition policy for the Pentagon, um, in the uh, former role of, the, of the, basically as the pricing czar, who was once described, I like to say, as the most hated man in Washington. Uh, you know, Shay told me the other day, I, I think that just meant that I was trying to get a good deal. Uh, I was trying to wield some of that better buying power that the previous administration had, had uh, told me to go after, and it seemed pretty reasonable. Uh, and then we've got, uh, we have Bill Elkington, a, uh, who's a former IP executive at uh, Collins Aerospace, a member of the 813 panel. And we have Kelly Kyes from Boeing, uh, who uh, runs IP uh, strategy for the Boeing company. It's a company with, uh, with a lot of IP, to say the least both on the commercial side of, of life and on the government side. So hope she should be able to give us a perspective about how things differ um, between, between uh, dealing with uh, a monopsonist like uh, you know, any given government uh, with respect to weapon systems, certainly the US government, a pretty big one, uh, and dealing with commercial customers and indeed suppliers. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about what prompted us to get this panel together. I was off doing some research, I found what I thought was a very interesting result. If Jerry, Jerry was saying earlier, uh, this is now my third paper that I've written on the subject of intellectual property rights and government procurement. The first two were fairly theoretical, and then I decided I thought I, well, I should gather some data and try to find a result. Does it matter? Does it matter if government owns the intellectual property rights uh, to, say, weapon systems that it is, or even any any system, complex system that it procures over a long period of time, what can you do with those rights? Can you leverage it into better prices? And uh, so if you have a chance to read the paper, or if um, you're going to perhaps read the paper, or you just want to hear about it now, the, um, the case that I looked at was something pretty uh, mundane. Trucks. Military forces buy trucks. The U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, they buy trucks. After the Cold War, they decided that um, they needed to replace their trucks, which they kind of prosaically refer to as medium tactical vehicles. So the uh, U.S. Army decided, well, we, we're going to buy a whole family of medium tactical vehicles. And we're going to call it the family of medium tactical vehicles. And in the process of buying uh, these vehicles, they actually managed to procure as well the design rights. They had the rights to base most of the design behind the trucks they were buying. Uh, and in parallel, the U.S. Marine Corps, because it had somewhat different requirements, reasonably so, they decided we need to replace our medium tactical vehicles. So we're going to launch a program called the Medium Tactical Vehicle Replacement. And but this time we're going to when we buy them, we're not really too concerned about buying and getting the data rights. So in one of those uh, programs, the the FMTV, as I say, the Family Medium Tactical Vehicles, the Army Trucks, the Army Truck Program was reconvened which is to say after buying five years of trucks, they went out and said, hey, could some, we got the design rights. Could somebody else build them for us? And a contractor, as it turns out, the Oshkosh Corporation, managed to take the contract away from the incumbent, the folks who had developed the vehicle and who'd sold the design rights to the Army. Uh, and in the process, the government saved about 9% on each truck that it bought. But when the Marine Corps bought its trucks and bought it again from Oshkosh, incidentally, uh, they did not get the design rights. So they didn't have an opportunity to recompete that program. They had to continue going back on sole source contracts. Now, I'm going to close the story by saying that the Army eventually winds up buying uh, some of its trucks on a sole source contract, and the Marine Corps winds up buying some of those trucks on a sole source contract. And so you might wonder, um, if you've got the IP rights, maybe you can leverage it for a better price if you're going to hold a competition. But there's a concept in economics called dynamic limit pricing where 
maybe uh, somebody who has an effective monopoly on something will gradually reduce the price just to ensure that nobody tries to get into the market. Did this happen with trucks? It's one went looking and devised a fairly careful pairwise comparison of certain lots of trucks to certain lots of trucks. And what I found was that uh, the Army paid, going from a competitive contract to a sole source contract, for the same stuff, for the very same vehicles, paid on that sole source contract 24% more two years later. In the Marine Corps, where the government did not have the rights to do a competition, uh, they wound up paying for their trucks 20% more. So the remarkable result to me, to me it was almost shocking that not only did the price go up by that much, but actually holding the design rights, at least in that one uh, set of comparisons, didn't matter. Now, maybe I should be shocked, sort of like, you know, Captain Renault in Casablanca, but, so I'll ask, I'm gonna go to our pricing czar. I'm gonna ask Shay, you ran pricing for the Tynagon. Um, should I be surprised, should I be shocked? Should, or, or is this not an unusual result? And does it, or maybe doesn't have too much to do with IPRs? Yeah, I, I don't think it should be shocked at all. Um, you know, the, the reality is that uh, I think that uh, the initial price that was paid really was a function of the company's desires to win the competition and be very aggressive in their pricing. Uh, and uh, both of them probably assumed, irrespective of whether the government bought the data rights or not, uh, that it wasn't going to be competed, which meant that um, you know they were able they were going to be able to propose their cost and recover a reasonable profit on that, and that's okay. I mean, I mean, sometimes we go into these competitions, even though the government they really don't ask or want companies quote unquote to buy in, companies will. And there's nothing illegal about it, just the way it is. Uh, we've actually had some companies bid zero for to supply a product in an initial competition because they wanted to get into a marketplace. Uh, so uh, the fact that the price went up um, approximately the same, you know, four points isn't a huge variation, um, was probably more a function of the companies trying to recover their cost and, uh, and get a reasonable profit on that cost. And whether or not uh, who you really have to look at is both the Navy and the Army and say, well, did, were they competent, right? Did they negotiate a fair price? Um, and my guess is they probably did, right? I mean, thinking of a reasonable cost plus a reasonable amount of profit on top of that. Well, they probably thought they were, right? Uh, and, and what you're measuring, what would be more interesting to know is you're measuring a price index. The real question would be, what was the profitability based on the actual cost that it took either of the two vendors to build that, pro that product subsequently? Now, that is... And it's hard for me to get, definitely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we had it, but you wouldn't. Uh, but the, um, you know, I, I started to think about this more and more. And the challenge uh, as we go forward, uh, the environment that you were looking at when you looked at the trucks, or, uh, and I, I, I probably participated in somewhere between 15 and 20 dual source competitions with missile systems and radars and radios, you name it. Um, I was involved in it, but my perspective was from an industry perspective, not involved as a government employee. And uh, during those competitions, a good part of those products were being built by those companies, right? That were competing by the primes. That world has completely changed. And, and the reality is the primes manufacture very little. For the most part, they assemble. They don't manufacture. And so what that means is we as the government need to do a much better job of understanding who actually owns the intellectual property 
Is it the prime or is it the subcontractors? And when I buy intellectual property from a prime, am I getting the sufficient intellectual property from the subcontractors? And then a further complication of that is that we're looking as the government to expand our commercial opportunity space, right? We want more commercial technology in our space. What that likely means is that uh, you're going to be dealing with a company who received no assistance whatsoever from the government in terms of the generation of their intellectual property, whereas a government contractor effectively recovers 100% of their IR&D expenditures, and they do it in a very short period of time. So you have, and, and that now when we start to add on to that, competing commercial companies with what I'll call traditional defense contractors, you have a very uneven playing field. You have a defense contractor who's been completely reimbursed for their IR&D and sometimes reimbursed for the IR&D directly or the R&D directly. And you have a commercial company who took nothing but a total and complete risk and used risk money to fund their IR&D. Totally different world. So as we move forward, a lot of our traditional thinking about intellectual property is going to have to change because uh, we're going, if we're successful, and I mean, we being the government, I'm a retired employee now, but I'm not speaking for the government. But if I was in the government, uh, I would be trying to make a thrust to get more commercial participation, to get advanced technologies from commercial companies. That's going to mean that we're going to have to radically change our view of how we acquire intellectual property and who has it. It's going to be quite a challenge for both the companies and, and, uh, and, and at essence of it, all take, it, take on top of that, how are you going to run the program 15, 20, 25 years from now? How are you going to spare it? Who's going to supply the spares? Are you okay in a commercial environment? And, and that takes an examination of the technology to say, well, are there going to be, is there going to be competitive pressures in the commercial marketplace that are going to control the price of their participation with the government? Because the government is not going to be the driver of commercial pricing, right? It's going to be the commercial marketplace if it's truly a commercial item. And then add on top of that, not to make it even more complex, Jim, this world of commercial of a type, which is really a defense item that people get to call commercial items. And so, you know, you, you, this is really a complex environment and it's gonna be a challenge for you and other, and other academia when they're looking at history because uh, an important element of that is going to be to try to understand, well, what was the make-buy composition during these particular competitions? You know, were, were the companies supplying the product? And, and for example, in the 80s, the companies built their own printed circuit boards. They, they had their own fab shops. They did all of their fabrication internally. You know, there were, there were only situations where there was a very unique skill that didn't exist within the company. For example, clash crimes and things of that nature, where they would go outside the company to buy them, right? And, and, but the companies were motivated, at least in that time frame, to keep things in house. That's turned on its head, right? I mean, you look at most products we buy, the supply chain is really manufacturing the product and the prime contractor is assembling it. That's what's going on. That's a lot. That was great. I, let, me, let me try to pull part of that out and pivot over to Richard because I'd like to um, give folks currently in government, 
uh, or our, co- our fellow who's currently in government a chance to 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 play, to build on that, to respond to that. You, um, mm-hmm. Richard, you so you, you just heard Shay was saying, well, you know, a twenty four percent price increase, depending on how badly they were doing before, how much money they were losing, that might not be unreasonable, and it's certainly not shocking. Um, and indeed, that's procurement. Um, which maybe you need to worry about, Shay's also saying is, you know, when, heck, I, I buy a car, if I keep it for 10 years, I'm, I'm keeping it a long time. Uh, the government, if the army buys a truck and they keep it for 10 years and ditch it, then that would be very strange. They tend to hold on to these things for a very long time. Uh, so sustainment and obsolescence is an issue. Can I ask, so what is, what is your office interested in? Maybe which which side of that, which end of that time horizon, and uh, and are we getting are we getting some reasonable results, and and if so, where are we not? Well, thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think you, in some meaningful respect, you answered, uh, you provided my answer in the first five seconds of your question, which is. Uh, the way we're approaching this is I'm turning first regarding the detailed, uh, you know, financial analysis to people just like Shay. In fact, a couple of years ago, I would have turned literally over to Shay and, and asked for assistance in this sort of, in, in that, that portion of the detailed analysis. Nowadays, we have uh, other folks, Shay's successors that, that I would rely on. It, and you mentioned at the beginning that the intellectual property, the new intellectual property cadre office that we've stood up within the acquisition and sustainment uh, division is uh, to be more clear about what that is. It really is a cross-functional team with expertise from, you know, legal, contracting, engineering, fiscal, sustainment, program management, you name it. Uh, we've got, uh, we are trying to tap into all that expertise. So we're really looking at full spectrum. Everything that you mentioned in your question, we're looking at. Uh, I do think that one of the biggest challenges that we have is is uh, is recognizing that when we've been saying for years we have to have IP strategies for our programs and we have to do them early, but we need to find a much better way to have meaningful engagement with industry, to talk about business models, business plans, and be able to predict for the long term. So we really are looking at not just this initial production and maybe the follow on production, but we're really looking at the entire sustainment tail uh, for that for that program. Um, And and until we hear differently, uh, competition appropriate in appropriate ways and appropriate manners. Uh, with with full understanding and respect for privately developed intellectual property, while understanding that when we're funding or co-funding the development of intellectual property, we have to be able to get our return on investment as well. And one of the primary ways we do that is by is by having the ability to to energize and insert competition in appropriate um, components. Um, I'm going to go ahead and relieve uh, Kelly of the obligation of saying it later. I'm just going to go ahead and say MOSA early on and get it out of the way. The modular open systems approaches is going to be one of the ways we are approaching this complicated concept of whether the IP is generated by the prime at the subcontract level, commercial, non-commercial, DOD funding, no DOD funding. Uh, there is a, a a great spectrum of different intellectual property uh, rights, implications, business models that are coming into any complex system, changing over time. And one of the ways that we're going to try to accommodate that is by taking a modular approach, trying to engage with our industry partners so that the government's intellectual property strategy and the private sector's intellectual property strategy for any given program are or synchronized, if nothing else, at least not inconsistent, uh, aware of each other and able to understand how they relate to each other. And I hope that doesn't sound too philosophical, uh, but uh, that that's a big part of what we're going to be doing. And we that we are going to we're heading into, I think, an unprecedented area where we're going to have um, routine, more robust, more detailed discussions and engagement with industry to be able to discuss these issues early and have these hard discussions about how are you how is your intellectual property strategy allowing us to have appropriate competition downstream where frankly you might not want us to have competition but we do and i, I can obviously go on but i i'll stop and allow others 
Well, let me let me pivot on that last thing you said because uh, you know you you said that um, we'd like to have government and industries, or rather, you know, government and its contractors, uh, IP strategies synchronized, or at least they shouldn't be in conflict. Um, so if I think uh, I'm trying to remember my game theory here, but if you've got, you know, uh, that suggests we can devise perhaps a cooperative game rather than a purely competitive one where there's some win-win to be achieved if we have, um, if we have opportunities to, to succeed together, okay, by, by dealing with IP, you know, on the same, uh, with the same mindset. Let me ask Kelly, uh, how would, perhaps how would the Boeing company or how do you think industry in general ought to, I mean, I'll ask Bill this in a bit too, uh, you know, how, where do you find those opportunities for synchronizing IP strategies? Uh, I mean, have, can you think of a program where you've done that recently or, or can you think of a program where, oh gosh, I really wish we'd been able to do that. Or is this a bit of a pipe dream? I mean, is it, is it really just, uh, or maybe is it a zero sum game and, and um, we are gonna have difficulty finding those win-wins? You tell us. So I definitely don't think it's a zero sum game. I think um, that it, we can't approach it in that way. I mean, I think what Richard described, um, you know, about having early conversations earlier in the life cycle, I think that that's absolutely necessary. Um, having dialogue around, you know, what the government's objectives are, what their needs are as expressed in the life cycle sustainment plan. Um, industry wants and needs that information. Um, we'll use that to adjust our, our business strategy, our proposal strategy. Um, also, it, we might take that information into account in making future investment decisions. Um, I think the dialogue is, is um, critical in that regard. Um, I, I, at the same time, I think you know, um, there is definitely inherent tension um, between the competing business models. Um, I, I'll just describe it that way because that's how the 813 panel described it in one of its um, early tension papers that, um, that you can find in, in the paper if you're interested in looking at it. But the paper does explore some of that tension between the government's needs for competition and sustainment and industry, specifically OEMs, needs to recoup their investment and generate a reasonable return on that investment. Um, and so there's, I think, healthy tension there um, uh, that I think we're always gonna have, right? We're never gonna completely see eye to eye, I don't think. I mean, I think it's definitely, um, uh, possible and necessary to identify win-win solutions, surely. Um, and I think we can identify those solutions. I will say, um, I do want to compliment the department because I have observed and my colleagues have observed this emphasis on earlier dialogue. It is happening. I mean, we do have some programs where that this, those discussions about um, the IP strategy are occurring in the technical maturation and risk reduction phases, you know, going into um, development. And I think that those are great conversations to have earlier. Um, I know for a couple major programs, there were also um, RFIs that were issued that were specifically focused on um, data rights. So, you know, how do you define certain terms? Um, how would you define OMIT data? Um, how would you define form, fit, and function data? Um, topics like that, I think, are good to get on the table early and have that dialogue and then follow up on those discussions in industry days and also, you know, in responding to draft RFPs. Let me go and ask, um, oh, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Was somebody I was just going to say, I, I, I would be happy to pile on that one thing that uh, I think we also need to mention early. Uh, a mechanism that we are going to start seeing more and more frequently that will support and facilitate this early discussion and long-term planning is uh, we will soon be looking at a, the implementation of a statutory preference to have special to use specially negotiated license rights for both non-commercial and commercial scenarios. That essentially by definition is going to drive us to the table to sit down and discuss things and plan for uh, creative, philosophical, potentially complex, uh, you know, potentially changing over time forms of license, escrow arrangements. There's going to be all sorts of, of, of things that we're going to have to be discussing uh, to try to have tailored 
agreements rather than uh, relying on the more traditional approach of just sitting back and, and working within the default or standard license rights that the DFAR specifies, which doesn't do us any good when we're talking to a commercial, non-traditional defense contractor. And so that's going to be something we're going to see. And that's going to change the way we engage on intellectual property matters by trying to negotiate more specially tailored deals uh, as a routine matter, in fact, having a preference for it. Or... Richard, since you're the, you're the law professor and I'm just on the business faculty, can you remind me where, uh, where, where, do, where was that statutory preference passed? Well, it, it's it's codified in the tech data, the main technical data statute, 10 U.S.C. 2320. Cool. Right. No, it's, it's, it's paragraph F, I believe, off the top of my head. And making so, it clear. I know how to look up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Kelly. I was just going to say, just to follow on to what Richard said, um, it's making its way through the rulemaking process. So there was already an advance notice of proposed rulemaking issued last year. There was a public meeting, which again, I'll just again take um, the opportunity to compliment the Bar Council on utilizing um, advance notices of proposed rulemaking and public meetings to enable the dialogue between industry and DOD, uh, specifically on topics like data rights, um, which is just inherently so technical. Uh, I think it has really been value added to enable that dialogue and um, really enable the listening and the understanding of what the concerns are and the needs are on both sides. So. And, and Jim, and well, the whole panel, everybody, I mean, that that's an example. I appreciate Kelly saying that because setting up those public meetings, using this new approach for advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, public meetings, and then followed up by the normal rulemaking scenario, where we're again having more public meetings, is one of the ways that we have, are, are demonstrating this commitment to have unprecedented levels of engagement with industry early on, not only in making individual business deals and thinking about program planning, but actually revising the entire implementation of the regulatory and statutory scheme. And it's we are doing that approach for every single uh, DFARS data rights case that we have, and we have seven of them, I think, running in parallel right now. Uh, that's, that's just one of the examples. You know, in terms of, uh, if I could make a comment, in terms of uh, valuation of, of IP um, and uh, how it's treated in a competitive environment, one of the things that the government's also going to have to do is uh, change its view of, um, of how, it, uh, how it deals with commercial companies who are competing with defense companies. Uh, for example, um, I, I know that uh, in, in a number of competitions that, that we have held in the government, um, especially as it re related with the use of, uh, uh, you know, some OTAs uh, where cost sharing was involved. Uh, basically, uh, the way it was being treated was that the commercial company had to take money out of its pocket and actually cost share, where the government uh, or the, uh, the defense contractor could use its reimbursed IR&D as its cost share. And, and that's about as unlevel a playing field as you can have, right? And so we really do need to step back um, as government and industry, because, you know, what we're after, and I can only speak from my historical perspective, not only a, as a government employee, but as a, as a uh, major defense contractor, right? They, they want to level, everybody wants a level playing field. And, and we need to rethink how we're dealing with not just the intellectual property, but how the intellectual property came about and, and how companies are being treated uh, when they're being expected to make cost shares, um, especially in a, in a research and development environment. Because if I'm going to get funded by government to do something, and I'm not risking my own money, I should, I think you're saying I should expect a certain return on that non-investment, if you will, or lower investment. And if I'm, I think you were saying earlier, if I'm betting some serious coin on something, then I, I have a reason to expect a completely different return because the risk is adjusted. Yeah, uh, and, and, and if you're expecting me to cost share, if not only do I have to bring my own independent research and development, but then I have to take more money out of my pocket to cost share, 
when I'm dealing with somebody who's taking their IR&D that's been government reimbursed and they're using that as the cost share. That's not quite level, right? That's not a level playing field. Well, let me give it, take the chance. So, oh, go ahead, Kelly. I was going to uh, respond to that a little bit because I think from a defense contractor perspective, we would not agree that in all cases that it, that it isn't a level playing field. I mean, I think you have to really assess what it is that you're developing in the OTA because if you're developing a product or service that's intended primarily for like a defense application, then IR&D is the color of money that you're going to utilize to develop that technology. Because if there's no commercial application for the technology, then if I develop that out of profit, which is um, what Shay was describing, then if, if I can't make a commercial sale or a direct commercial sale, um, then there's no way for me to recoup that investment because the cost accounting standards don't provide for that um, recoupment vehicle other than through IR&D. Um, so to some extent, I, you know, it is challenging when you're looking at, you know, commercial uh, companies who are non-traditional who generally um, work in the commercial space versus traditional defense contractors. Um, I will say that, you know, there are, a, you know, a great deal or maybe not a great deal, but there are, um, you know, some uh, many prime contractors and middle tier contractors play in both spaces, right? So Boeing's not the only company that has both a commercial and a defense um, a division uh, as part of our portfolio and other defense contractors are the same. And I will say that the investment decision-making is different in commercial and defense, but also the the profit, right, is different as well. So in, in the commercial space, um, uh, you don't have the, you know, a, a, a DOD profit policy. You don't have a, a, a FAR and a DFARS regulations that you are complying with. Um, in the defense world, yes, as Shay has alluded to, um, there is much better cash flow, right? Um, but I think that the risk proposition associated with that commercial and that defense investment is reflected in the profit margins across commercial and defense. But I think you would That's find surprisingly so, that the profit margins of many commercial companies are in fact lower than defense companies. So it's, it doesn't necessarily hold true that just because I'm a commercial company, I, uh, because of the competitive market, it, the marketplace I deal in, now if, I'm a, if I'm a commercial company in a sole source environment, I'm able to do some things perhaps that really increases my profit margins. But if I'm in a competitive environment and I'm talking about the industrial sector, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, Apple and Facebook and all that stuff. I'm talking about people who build things uh, or manufacture things. It, it's a very different profit margin scenario. It, it, it really is. Let me ask uh, Bill, I want to go to Bill because, um, you know, Kelly was saying, Hey, it's not just us. There are a lot of you know military companies that, that sell to government and also sell to us. I think maybe Collins Aerospace, where you used to work, is one of those. Is it different uh, if you're in the middle of the supply chain and you're you're not actually making jet aircraft, but you're making stuff that goes on, say jet aircraft, and also selling to the government those subsystems built? So thanks uh, for having me on the panel, Jim and and Jerry. It's good to be here. Um, good to renew acquaintances with all the, the folks on the panel. Um, know at least a couple of them, a few of them well. And Shay and I've kind of been, uh, been in various, working together on various things over the years too. So, um, so I guess the business model, you, you know, this came up in the 813 panel on a number of occasions is really sort of fundamental to um, understanding what's going to work for for companies and and uh, for the government. And often you'll have a business model where people will put huge quantities of profit into the development of some new or modified system or subsystem for commercial sales and then, um, and then want to provide the benefit 
of that to the government um, through sales of a modified version of that system or subsystem uh, uh, to DOD. Um, the issue arises when, uh, one of the issues that arises in the discussion is, at least in the past, um, my experience that the DOD program office will insist on or will, will try very hard to get government purpose rights to the intellectual capital in that commercial system that um, is being modified. So often, the, and often the modifications uh, can be quite um, trivial from an investment point of view. So I recall one system that um, one of my former employers, I've worked in aerospace and defense for all my career and worked for GE and ITT before Collins Aerospace. And to some extent, this is, this is true uh, of, uh, of, of them as well, that you know, in, one, in one particular case, I, we, we had uh, an investment program that ran to about a billion and a half dollars for a for a product line and some of its variants, and uh, and and the government uh, was going to pay us something in the neighborhood of a hundred million to do modifications and testing, and about half of that money was really for for testing, and and so the the attitude of the program office was that they. They should get ownership-like rights, GPR, to all of that commercial investment, um, along with the investment that they were going to be making uh, of about fifty million dollars. So, so this seems, you know, back to, to Richard's. Uh, uh, we've had these conversations for years. The the sense of the equities here just didn't doesn't sort of add up. Um, and you say, well, the government can't really make use of uh, if it gets GPR to the stuffs that it, um, it paid for. It can't really make use of it because if it can't get GPR to everything else in the system, then then it, it's sort of dead in the water. And and the answer is, well, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of the way it works on the commercial side of the companies. You know, you you have customers that want variants and the variant would only be for them and it, it isn't saleable to other people um, and uh, because peculiar to that. And so you have this business model that really is tailored to um, being, to modifying something, a, a product or a set of products that have been developed a lot of money, and and the idea is to modify that product suite to meet the specific needs of each of the customers that comes along. And if you don't see a benefit generally to that modification, you will often say to that commercial customer, "Well, we're happy to do it for you, but you're going to have to pay for it." And then they want all kinds of rights, um, and inevitably you end up saying, no, you can't have all kinds of rights because our business model would go, would go south. So I, I did want to mention that I do think having at the table in those early discussions, experts in valuation of IP rights is critical because in order to assess um, the, the very question that Jim raises in his paper, you know, how much good is it really going to do us to get these rights? You want someone there to be able to do the financial analysis. And, I, you know, I, I've dealt with people in our in finance departments um, uh, for many years and they just don't know how to do this generally, right? I mean, that's my personal experience. I'm not saying no, nobody in, in a finance department anywhere, 
I'm just saying my personal experience is that, that people in finance are not the, they're, they're certainly educable, right? But they don't necessarily know how to do an assessment, a fair-minded objective assessment of the value of intellectual property rights. But they're not often IT valuation experts. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I think the I, I think the the you know to uh, kind of amplify what Bill is saying, you know, one of the other things we have to place a value on is very complex. What we're talking about is really complex, but you got to place a value on the time benefit of having a company coming forward with a product that's ready made. Right, I don't have to go through a development, uh, yeah. and so not only am I not spending the money for the development, I'm not taking the three years or the four years or the six years or however many, many years it would have taken to develop and qualify that subsystem. Now, yes, it will have to go through some degree of qualification, commercial or not, got that. But we have to now start to expand our view of the value of intellectual property from the benefit of the time value of the product itself and how quickly can I get it to the field, right? How, how, how quick, what is it doing to help me uh, provide additional capability to the warfighter quicker? You know, at the end of the day, if I'm still going to get it to him 10 years from now, then, you know, it's not going to have as much value to me. But if I'm under the gun to get something into the field right away, then, you know, the value of that uh, providing that commercial product in its end state or near, near end state becomes really important. Right? And really. that necessarily assumes if someone's bringing the IP, I think you're saying. Yeah, well, bringing the IP and bringing the product, right? right. I mean, the, right, in, in essence, what we're, what we're trying to do right, is we're trying to buy commercial products that have already been developed. So, and have a logistical supply chain in, in place already so that we don't have to make those investments. So, uh, you know, as, as Richard and his team steps back from this, they're gonna have to evaluate, well, what's it, what's it actually cost to develop this? That's one thing, if we decide to do it ourselves. Secondly, am I really getting a benefit by having the product right now versus, you know, what are the pluses and minuses of if I just go develop it myself versus get a commercial product? If the answer is, well, you're getting a unique technology that no other company presently has, then that's, a, you know, that puts you in a very different environment than one that says, well, there are quite a few companies that could probably develop something like and, this. And that point is critical, right? Is, yeah. is what, who else is out there and what are the other options that are available in this hopefully competitive environment? And so one of the other things that we're about to see, and I don't think I mentioned it yet, but we are just now kicking off a multi-year uh, pilot program to study intellectual property evaluation in major programs that, that by statute requires us to, to incorporate uh, commercially available uh, IP valuation techniques, the maximum extent practicable, to evaluate those and to engage with industry as we're doing so. So for the next four years, we're going to be doing reports on this and, and doing studies on this. And so having these discussions and being able to understand what the products are available, who's got what the relative uh, merits of this company's approach versus that, who's more mature, who's, where's the risk. I think in Bill's scenario, there was a hundred million dollars of testing to occur for that particular scenario. That's something we'd like to think about as well. Uh, it, but just being able to have those discussions in a candid manner, rec and for us, let's be honest, in a competitive environment is where we want to have that discussion. Uh, but being able to talk about those business models and, rec and talking about investment, return on investment, and how that all plays in, uh, simply having opening that dialogue and being able to have hard discussions in a competitive environment is, is one of the things we're going to be seeing a lot of. Richard, you know, is there, is you, Kelly, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm curious if the if is the pilot program focusing on just contracts? Are you looking across um, 
contracting vehicles to include OTAs and um, the like. It's focused primarily. Uh, it was, it's on programs. Um, so we're looking at, we're, we're identifying programs that will, that will be, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, participating as named programs where we're going to look at what's been happening, uh, look at evaluation uh, activities that are occurring, uh, do some testing on uh, innovative techniques, but we're also going to be, as, as part of this pilot, be doing sort of a more uh, across the board review of what all the department is doing across its programs and looking at all sorts of instruments and ways that occur. Because the concept, one of the first questions for this pilot is, what do you actually mean by IP evaluation? You don't just mean in a competitive source selection, right? I mean, there's there's tons of other scenarios in which evaluation occurs. Sole source negotiations is an obvious second uh, second listing, for example. Uh, and it's not just procurement contracts, right? It's, it's OTAs. It's any other instrument we might use in developing feeder technologies, inserting te prototype projects, inserting technologies downstream, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, and I, I would mention, um, and I'm pretty familiar with, with a, a bunch of specialty companies that do this kind of thing. And, and uh, they are uh, generally not familiar with DO, the DOD procurement environment, the language and the meaning and, and even how to think about valuation in that, that context. I mean, I have high regard for these companies um, and I know principals in, in between a half a dozen and a dozen of them. And they're very good at um, what they do, but what they do isn't valuation of intellectual capital rights in a DOD context. So, so when we are talking about this, we do need to have um, uh, people who actually know how to do this stuff, have experience doing it, understand the language of DOD contracting, what the rights are, what the meaning of the rights um, are, and so on. Uh, Bill, I couldn't be happier to have you make that a point that it's not just grabbing a commercial valuation technique that use, that's designed for a purely commercial to commercial transaction and then saying, DOD, you should use that approach. Right. It's got to be Absolutely. adapted. It's got to yeah. be in, uh, evaluated. And that's that's really is one of the core elements of this, of this pilot, as you know, because this was a, one of the recommendations of the 813 panel. Right. And, you know, going back to what Bill said earlier about the fact that you typically don't have people in you know on in your, on your finance team if you're a defense contractor who are valuation experts and i just wanted to make the point that the primary reason for that is that historically defense contractors are using their own ip to provide products and services right so generally speaking unless the government is asking for broader rights than they would otherwise be entitled to under the law and applicable regulations, um, you would just essentially be asserting whatever rights category lines up with the funding test if it's non-commercial technology. I do think that initiatives like MOSA um, do, do place emphasis on valuation because now there are opportunities to now take like a software product that one company might have that might be, you know, the best whatever um, software solution um, that's out there right now and then say, okay, well, maybe there's an opportunity to uh, make a sale of this software to get it on somebody else's platform. And I think those are the types of scenarios which are really more analogous to the commercial market where you now have an opportunity to develop a business model on a product that you're no longer just going to embed in the system you're offering to the, to the government, but rather essentially possibly license it to the government so that they can provide it to others or it, or to license it to your competitors that are acting in that space. Um, I also wanted to go back to something Shay said about um, the speed, you know, and um, flexibility. Like if you do have somebody who has this cutting edge commercial technology that nobody else has, I mean, that's really why the other transaction authority is is available, right? It's It's for speed. It's to enable that flexibility. Sorry, here we go again. Um, and to enable the parties to, to take those considerations into place when um, negotiating IP. Um, at the same time, I, you know, going back to Shay's comment about leveling the playing field, you know, I do think that Congress took that in consideration when establishing the prototype authority for OTAs because 
if you're a non-traditional contractor or you're a small business, it, uh, you actually don't have to provide a cost match um, for prototype OTAs. Um, but if you are a traditional defense contractor, you do have to provide a cost match. And I think that that was one of the ways that Congress sort of leveled that playing field by saying, traditional defense contractors, you can participate in OTAs as well, but you are going to have to bring some funding to the table in order to do so. You know, I've got uh, two questions from the audience that I wanted to work in because I, your ship has been very good about sending these in. Um, the, uh, actually, now we're up to three. Hold on. Um, one comes in specifically for Shay, and uh, the question is, it goes back to the bit about uh, loss-leading contracts. And uh, so the question we've got is that it seems like Shay is saying that it makes sense for companies to bid unrealistic money losing prices uh, to win contracts, assuming that their IP rights will hold and provide them, I'm sort of, uh, you know, stemporizing here, provide them a, a bit of a, a monop monopolistic advantage to a certain extent in follow on contracts. Uh, but then the actual price discovery doesn't occur until later. And then that leads to a, a material and perhaps even expected increase in costs. But but he wants to know, the questioner wants to know, does that does that make sense? Should should price discovery ideally occur earlier? And does, I mean, does it make sense for the government to get the good deal up front? Does it make sense for government companies to buy in? Uh, this is legal, of course. I mean, it, I, as I recall, it has stood up to uh, to challenges in in. Indeed, even in the FMTV program, uh, to 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 GAO challenges. Uh, what do you think, Shay? Is this? Is this yeah, a I think I think I think somebody may have misunderstood what I said. Please. Uh, the government, at least my experience with the government, never encouraged a company to buy in. And I can tell you, in the twenty years of industrial experience that I had, and I, and I have, I was involved in a a multitude of, uh, well, all the major stuff I was involved in and not once did the company quote unquote buy in, right? And so, um, you know, it depends on the company, right? There are some companies who believe that that is a successful strategy for them. It is not the preferred strategy of the government, right? The government really isn't interested in creating uh, you know, environments where companies have put themselves at financial risk up front and eventually, uh, you know, end up in extremis where the government has to deal with that environment in a number of instances, right? What I'm saying is that uh, it is a strategy. Some companies use it. I don't endorse it. Uh, I, I, I think that there's a lot of different ways to make money, but buying in isn't one of them because you don't stay in business long if, if you are not successful with that strategy. And so um, I must have been, uh, if I misspoke or was misunderstood, I want to make it very clear. I don't support buying in. I don't think it's a wise strategy. And I know when I was in government, we I don't recollect ever participating in a program where people were uh, pleased with the fact that a particular company had decided they were going to buy in. The, the discussion always was, well, it's not, we can't prevent companies from, you know, doing what they do. And uh, so maybe that's a little clearer. No, no, I think that is. Uh, let me, let me pitch another one here that we've gotten from uh, viewership. Uh, I want to ask specifically, I, want, I, th I think this is a good one for Bill because of your experience at Collins, your career at Collins, but also to Richard, because uh, you're the guy in government who thinks about this. Question we've got, and I, I've heard this assertion before. I've heard this assertion before that companies, many companies, are actually more concerned about the government releasing their IP to a competitor than by any internal use of that IP by the government itself. And... Um, uh, and there's actually a reference to OMIT data and somebody, OMIT, and I think somebody can actually maybe help me with that acronym because I, I, I'm not familiar. But uh, here's the father who continued the question. It's how might intended use be better defined in early discussions similar to commercial practice 
to license for a well-specified field of use? That's the question. Either Richard or, uh, or Bill. Richard, you want to start out? You're, you're on mute. You go ahead, Bill. Okay. Um, well, yes. Uh, <laughs> in a word, that is the, the major concern because we don't expect most agencies, the federal government, for example, to make avionics products um, in competition with, with Collins Aerospace. So, so yes, in a word, that is the concern. And it's very difficult, uh, you know, we, we talk uh, among ourselves, uh, uh, defense contractors and, and uh, commercial, uh, commercial aerospace companies and so on, uh, little companies and big companies and so forth. And there are a lot of horror stories out there about people's intellectual capital falling in, into the hands of competitors or falling into the hands of, of a, a different p &L center within, within a company. Uh, so I'm talking about commercial now and that other p &L center feeling like it has leave to compete, use that IP in ways that, that it wasn't licensed to be used and so forth. So, so yes, that is it in a nutshell. Uh, that is the concern and, and it's, you know, it's like our future, the future of the company and in a particular product line uh, and so forth. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's, uh, I agree with all that, by the way, omit operation, maintenance, installation, and training. Ah, thank is you. The, um, right. Right. And generally speaking, top level data, although we can't talk about this for very long without talking about that. The notion is that omit data, the default license for that is unlimited rights. However, that unlimited rights does not cover omit data. That is also another acronym, DMPD standing for detailed manufacturing or process data. Uh, so this is a, a, a long discussion that, for example, was probably about one year of the two and a half years of the 813 panel uh, discussions. But, um, and, and there's, there's at least two answers, I think, to the original question. One of them is that the default right scheme, even as it is, is if you didn't negotiate something special, is designed to be sensitive to that. That is the nature of the DMPD carve out for example, of OMIT. That is the notion that if it is proprietary, the, the question I think presumes that it was refers to proprietary IP, uh, presuming if we mean it's developed entirely at private expense, then the standard license the government would get would not allow that information to go to competitors, except in very specific, essentially statutorily carved out uh, scenarios like emergency repair and overhaul. Although there are ones now that, that, that are uh, more interesting to the vendors, uh, that the government's allowed to provide it to support contractors for certain scenarios. And, and when we're talking about, even when we're talking about this, then the next, one of the next things that's going to come up is the government has an interest in ensuring it meets its statutory requirements for core logistics capabilities and things like that. And even when we are doing things in house, uh, we frequently or not infrequently also do have on-site support contractors. And that's when we start getting into the notion of let's describe in more detail how the government is intending to support sustain this this item and figure out whether that leads itself into a specially negotiated license discussion um and at the risk of sounding like a professor before i'd be quiet here using an interest-based negotiations uh, approach rather than a position-based approach like i need gpr because that's the only standard license that gives me comp competition rights uh is is how we're uh, we're looking at this is let's talk about what we want to do first and then talk about how we can tailor a license to make that happen if i could follow on to richard i think the richard mentioned that the DoD has other statutory obligations and i think that relationship and sometimes tension between the data rights statute and the logistics statutes like the 50-50 rule, depo level maintenance. I think that's where this preference for specially negotiated licenses becomes so important because as Richard say, as, as Richard said, if it's if OMIT is top level data um, and it excludes detailed manufacturing and process data, which it does by by statute and and the regs. 
um, then well, what happens if there is other types of data or software that, um, that the government might need for its own organic maintenance purposes or for its own organic depot level maintenance purposes, which gets down to a lower level, um, then what do you do in those cases, right? Um, and I think oftentimes there's this sort of um, tension around the definition of OMET and this tendency on the part of the government to try to um, define all data that might be necessary for any level of maintenance into this category of OMET data. When I think instead, as Richard said, if you focus on sort of that interest-based assessment and, and, and identify, well, what are the government's organic maintenance needs and what are their, um, their competition desires as far as licensing to third parties, if you focus on that interest-based approach, then you can sort of talk about, well, can we craft a specially negotiated license here that will give you the data that you need to do what you need to do, but at the same time, from a contractor's perspective, enable them to protect what they really need to do. And as the person who asked the question sort of intimated, um, oftentimes it's really not that much of a concern about the government's own organic use and enabling depo level maintenance in as much as it's a concern about that data falling into the hands of competitors who are operating um, on the sustainment side who haven't made those same investments um, to the extent you're talking about, you know, um, uh, products that have been developed exclusively at private expense. So I just wanted to add what, that. One more tiny thing that I think we have to mention uh, that, that is not brought up naturally by this discussion is additive manufacturing. 3D printing and additive manufacturing is, is a new wrinkle in the idea of the government. As Bill mentioned, uh, traditionally, you wouldn't anticipate the government being a supplier of particular products or things like that. And, and clearly for an avionics package, that's a little, that's different. But for something that is additive manufacturable, 3D printable, uh, there's a whole new um, uh, practical uh, consideration that, that is arising now. And a lot of folks on the government side are, there are some tough discussions happening to let them know that uh, even though you've thought for years that the idea of limited rights uh, means in-house use only, and you just want to go ahead and manufacture it in-house with a, with a 3D printer, but you didn't realize that there was a limitation on the government not being able to, to manufacture additional quantities that's been built in there for years that didn't really matter before because we didn't have a manufacturing capability that we do now. That's going to be a big point of discussion in the future. Uh, and it's not really a change in the law. It's just a change in the, the technology that's available that would permit spare parts, local 3D printing is something that as a, as a business model and as a, as a capability that didn't exist before is going to be a discussion we're going to be having a lot in the future as well. Well, and as, as Richard oh, said, ahead, Kelly, please. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, because as Richard said, the definition of limited rights um, specifically prohibits manufacturing. But if a company is developing, you know, a manufacturing, uh, an additive manufacturing um, approach to a particular product, um, you know, those are the opportunities for that dialogue with between the contractor and the government to determine, well, who's ultimately going to print the part, right? I mean, and you have to take that in consideration in scoping that license because you can't, you know, provide the data with the expectation that the government's going to print the part and then not specially negotiate the license rights so that they can actually print the part. Um, so I think that that's really important. I also think, uh, I know that DOD is in the process of finalizing its um, DOD um, additive manufacturing strategy. And I know that at least uh, I think AIA and NDIA did respond and provide some comments. I think one of the policy um, level topics that, that industry raised in those responses is what is the role of the government as a manufacturer, right? Um, because we typically have thought about, uh, thought as the government as a maintainer of systems. So what is the role? Uh, I think that's an interesting topic to explore from a policy perspective. Kelly, let me ask, um, I want to ask about prevalence because I want to ask first you, uh, specifically because of Colin, but I also want to ask um, Bill, his uh, experience at Collins. Um, you know, before, uh, your company at one point was considering bidding for the um, ground-based strategic deterrent program. You dropped out for some understandable reasons. Before that, I remember uh, when your top people, Leanne Carrick, was uh, quoted in the press as saying, well, we had this problem with our, she was asked about some IP leaking from Boeing over to, uh, to Northrop Grumman. You said fall into the hands of, I mean, it sounded like you were talking about the Russians, but I think actually we're talking about another contractor. Uh, she said, she was asked about it, said, yeah, because the vector was through the government. It was actually through the Air Force. 
and she got the question, uh, is that alarming? And she said, well, you know, it's, this isn't the first time this has happened. It, it kind of, we, we expect that on a program, this happens to a certain extent. We just try to keep it, keep it to a minimum. Um, is it really that? Is it, is, it, is, it, is that alarming? Is it not alarming? Are there things we can do to make that better? Or is that just sort of a cost of doing business with the Defense Department? Um, well, I can't speak to the specific, um, I haven't seen the specific um, article. No, here, but close, not, but... My response is going to be general in nature, not specific to any one program. Um, I, I mean, I, my comment earlier about your, you know, your data being passed on to your, um, to a competitor in that situation, I, and I should clarify, I meant through like legal means, right? So my point was that if the government desires the license rights that are broad enough to enable them to share your data with a competitor, that that's where the rub is going to be for the OEM. Um, to Because you have to understand from an OEM perspective um, how that's going to impact your business, right? So if I'm going to especially negotiate a license and I've got a product that I, or portions of a product that I've developed at private expense, then I'm going to be concerned about what business opportunities um, are going to be enabled by handing by by providing the data with the license rights necessary, so the government can provide it to another party to compete against me. So that's what I was describing. As far as like, is it just sort of you know the nature of doing business with the government? Um, the regulations do provide uh, solutions if if a supplier is concerned about um, providing you know, like uh, secret sauce um, that it has to be a deliverable. I think first and foremost, the, the supplier is going to try not to deliver it in the first place. Um, but the regulations do provide a path to provide that data directly to the government. So you don't always have to go through the prime contractor, for example, in delivering data. I think sometimes that might be complicated by the fact that the prime contractor is integrating various piece parts of the system together, right? So sometimes from a practical perspective, that might be might not be a path forward. But I think you know, whether you're in the defense industry or commercial industry, it's not really industry specific. I mean, from an IP perspective, um, all companies and all OEMs are concerned about the transfer of know-how, right? Um, and it's a really hard thing to protect against, right? So if I, uh, if I'm working with you and I may not be providing like my detailed procedures, but if you're a contractor working with me in my facility, um, and you watch how I do something over and over again, or I teach you how to do something, then you are learning, you know, for me. And it's really hard to protect against that know-how transfer. And I, and I'm, you know, that's also, but it's sort of the nature, it, 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 it's always a risk across industries, right? It's not really defense specific. Yeah, I, you know, there are, um, there are studies uh, uh, of this. I think John, um, Huntsman, uh, former governor of Idaho and ambassador yeah. to China, um, uh, did, uh, did a study and updated it, I think in 2017, about theft of US uh, intellectual capital. And I think his estimate was in the, certainly in the hundreds of billions of dollars a year, if not, uh, you know, it was 350 to 500 million billion dollars a year, something like that. And a lot of that is actually exposed through supply chains. Um, so it's not just bad actors in a company or, or cyber attacks on, on an enterprise's information network. It's also when you provide pr proprietary information to your business partners, whether they're suppliers or customers or or co-development partners of one kind or another, you supply that to them because they need it in order to do their part of the whatever the, the complex system is. And it, it tends to walk out the door um, one way or another. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a real risk across all industries um, of, of losing, not only as Kelly said, know-how, through teaching others, but also proprietary information that's related to business process, that's re related to technology, that's related to product design, and so on. Yeah, so it's not, it's not the US government that, that is uniquely risky. It's just that it's, it is very risky to hand over 
important uh, revenue, you know, you're depending on this to differentiate you in the marketplace. You hand it to somebody else and there's a real risk that your differentiation is going to go away. And you won't necessarily know that it got stolen. I mean, it, you know, the companies don't generally put a lot of money into monitoring the, the marketplace for um, stolen proprietary information um, and for misuse of their, of their licensed technology. So it's going back about, Bill, I want to ask, it's going back about 12 years for me, but I, I did a book once about defense contracting and, and, and corporate alliance management. And one of the things I looked at was the issue about leakiness of knowledge. And I, I often got the pitch from people that, uh, well, a certain amount of, of leakiness, a certain amount of sort of, you know, appropriation of your, your, your intellectual capital, maybe not your intellectual property. And I, if that make that distinction, I think it's a big distinction that you like to, to, to emphasize. I mean, a certain amount of that leakiness is necessary just to for, for, for having an efficient supply chain that has multiple companies. But when does yeah. it get? When do you start to get stressed out about it? What's what's the flag that says, "Well, hold on, went too far"? Yeah, well, um, it's it's different in different circumstances. But I guess that the way the, the way I think about it is that that you have people in often in your enterprise who actually, because they wanna be good people and because they wanna have good personal relationships with other people in other organizations and because they're asked for certain information, they end up wanting to give it when in fact, it's really not in the company's best interest to give that information. So one of the issues um, that I've seen is uh, an inadequate briefing and monitoring of uh, these these uh, development teams, right? So, um, and there's no program by program policy often that's put in place and monitored and and reinforced and taught and so forth for the members of the team. That and so. You know, let's take a mundane example. I have a document on my desk. It's a 300 page document. And it has in it about 10 pages of information that is needed by the other party in a particular development program. So am I gonna take the time to redact or to, to take out from that document, those 10 pages? Um, I'm, I'm an engineer and I've, I'm under pressure to, to produce and so on. Generally, if I'm left to my own devices, I just send the 300 page document. Yeah. Some of it's, uh, be, some of it's behavioral. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let me ask, um, I got another question from the audience and uh, Shay, it's a follow up on the um, buy-in thing. <laughs> um, I'm gonna summarize it because it's a long one uh, from George. It says, um, uh, basically, uh, okay, yeah, so we don't like, we're not recommending buy-in, but, but was there, there was there a period of time, like maybe around 2000 and thereafter, where we seem to signal, hey, we're not going to mess with your data rights as long as you bring us good prices? And have we seen, a, a, has this been a sort of a, you think there's been a profound policy change since then, say since maybe the first Bush administration, or maybe even going back to the Clinton administration? Yeah, I, I was on the industry side during that time, and and I didn't see that. I mean, if, if someone, if some company heard that or saw it, um, the company I, I was at, I was with, uh, uh, didn't experience it, at least not to my knowledge. So I I I really can't. Uh, make a comment about someone saying, give me a good price. I won't screw around with your intellectual property. You know, I mean, the, the, the reality of life is that um, there is so much uh, in terms of uh, uh, training and education that needs to take place uh, within the acquisition community, the government acquisition community and understand, and it's a hard this is a subject where when you start to talk about it internally, uh, at least my experience in government, you know, people's eyes roll over. 
And frankly, so do company size rollover for most people, right? It's a very arcane, uh, but important, extremely important uh, topic. And uh, the, the reality is that um, I didn't experience uh, on the industrial side during that time frame uh, situations where companies were uh, trying to Shanghai our, or tell us that they wouldn't take our intellectual property. Uh, in fact, I found very few instances where we couldn't figure out a way to give the government what they needed and still protect our intellectual property. I mean, it just, it wasn't this major massive problem, at least in the procurements that, that we were, we somehow figured it out with the government. Now, the good, the reason for that is on most of the major programs in the, in the nineties, especially, right. Uh, Raytheon was on the, uh, the receiving side of getting intellectual property from other companies because they were competing in a second source environment or in a leader follower environment. So it, it, it wasn't, um, and, and the government was, encouraging companies to participate in that environment, right? That is to compete and to make the investments that were necessary so that they could become, um, you know, competitive sources. And I think I mentioned to you before that uh, what was discovered uh, during many of those competitions was that, uh, and, and the examination of that intellectual property was that, uh, the company decided to do things very differently than the actual original manufacturer because uh, we felt we being on the on the gov on the company side of this at that time that we could produce the product much more efficiently and much cheaper if we used a totally different process and we did. I don't want your IP. <laughs> that's right. I mean that that's fundamentally what went on, and I think one of the things that this this whole environment of that Richard and his team need to think about too is when you want competition, how do you want that competition to take place? Is it two companies that are participating in the in the early development of the overall product? And in that environment, the sharing of intellectual property between the two companies is completely different than if you're saying, no, what we're going to do is have one prime contractor build this product and design it and build it. And then we want you to come in afterwards and either build it to print or, or build the same product form, fit and function. Very different intellectual property discussions between the two companies when that happens. I've got, I've got uh, two more questions that are coming from uh, the audience, uh, one, by, one by chat and one actually directed me by email. Um, and it, they're related, so let me uh, try to combine them. They're both about, um, about education and training. Uh, and I think that uh, they're, they're probably very important for Richard, so maybe if you want to lead on the um, response here. Um, uh, and they get to, to, to 813 questions. Um, I think that for Bill, you were stressing the importance, and Richard, you had, you had noted that uh, you know there are, our contracting people, our finance people, they need whether in the side of government or they're in, uh, in industry, but certainly government. Uh, question goes: they need to understand IP valuation, and um, and our, our I've heard the assertion that you know our, our technology transfer people might be part of this, but they need to understand contracting. Our acquisition people need to understand all of this. And they also need some training uh, on the question of, uh, of IP protection. You know, uh, how, at, at what point, as I was saying to you, Bill, um, at what point uh, is, is showing a little bit, showing a little bit too much? You know, how do you keep uh, the IP segregated in, in ways that you, you shouldn't? And, 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 and when can you hint at things in a, in a, in a negotiation? Uh, so what are you doing? Uh, Richard, because um, you know one of the one of the email question I got said, "Man, I'm slammed here doing what I'm doing. I don't know how how much more I can learn." You know, certainly some of our people. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, training the acquisition workforce is a 
a gigantic part of this uh the approach to trying to get a better handle on our ip that that we're doing now and that's part of the reason why we have the notion of the ip cadre which is designed to be a much smaller group of more expert uh individuals cross-functional again all disciplines that are relevant to uh to acquisition and development, et cetera. Um, but then have at the same time, as we are uh, being smarter, learning lessons, uh, developing best practices is being able to make sure we can share that back out with the work acquisition workforce. And so DAU is a, you know, hand in glove partner with all of these activities. They now have two people on staff full time whose job is to teach IP. We're doing a top down and bottom up review of the curriculum that exists to make sure that we can integrate intellectual property into the training that the career fields are getting when they're already doing the rest of their training. It's not just that IP is some standalone thing that you either might take a course or might not. It's If it's part of your job, it needs to be part of your core training uh, elements. Um, we also have a brand new, uh, just released uh, right at the in, in September, there's a brand new intellectual property credential that is available. We're calling it the foundational intellectual property credential. It's more like a sort of apprentice level uh, uh, expertise for that anybody in the acquisition workforce can get by taking certain courses. One of which, by the way, is a brand new uh, continuous learning module on IP valuation that DAU uh, prepared in, in close uh, effort with industry. Um, and so there's, there's, and the DAU overall is revamping the way it's doing its training, moving away from a certification approach to a just in time uh, uh, expertise, sort of training insertion, if you will, education insertion for folks who, get, who can get things in real time, right when they need it to do their job on whatever topic makes sense. And so the entire DAU is, is becoming more efficient at that. And IP is definitely ha has a much stronger uh, place at the table than it ever has in the past. Uh, it's going to take time, of course, to ramp up all of that, all that content. Uh, but that's part of the reason why uh, we have this office and why we have the notion of the, the DOD IP cadre that is really DOD wide tapping into all those cross-functional expertise. No, Richard, I, uh, I, I, we, I should mention that we have here at George Mason, we have a great partnership with DAU. Uh, they co-sponsor our, our annual conference. Uh, and I do know that you're at George Washington, but dude, you're still doing an advertisement for another university here in the middle of my, no, it's okay. <laughs> I express no preferential treatment for any uh, non-governmental entity That's uh, as my official <laughs> statement. I said we have a very good relationship with them. They're, right. they're doing important work. Um, very good. I think that's My wife went to George Mason. I'm very fond. Thank you. So. Thank you. We think the world of George Washington, too. Um, okay. That's that's most of what we've got from the audience. And we are, uh, I think we're, Jerry, can you remind me? I think we're supposed to wrap up about one o'clock. Is that about right? Did we lose Jerry? Uh, yeah, no, this is, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess we could, uh, you know, if you have any closing thoughts from around the panel and. Uh, that would be terrific. Yeah. And so and your closing thoughts and uh, thank everybody for the great participation. Great questions, great discussion, uh, and uh, these are these are the right kind of people to address these kind of issues. And we really appreciate your perspective. If anybody's got two, three sentences, uh, go ahead and let's fly. We got some talkative folks. I have learned. I'm the, I wrote the paper and I've learned an enormous amount just listening. But uh, but Shay, Bill, Richard, Kelly, what? Uh, any final thoughts? Yeah, you know my my thought is um, we have some terrific people in government and uh, Richard uh, uh, I mean he can he can hit it out of the park with with anybody who wants to step up to the plate on the other side of the table and so uh, we uh, when when we enter into these dialogues um, I think there needs to be um, patience and understanding on both sides of the table because both sides need to articulate um, you know, their views in a very complex environment that, and we've been talking a little, about, little bit about that complex environment. But um, you know, the fact that the government, and it was really Congress, the fact that Congress uh, stood up or, or told the department to stand up 
this, uh, this capability. It was a great thing. And uh, we certainly have the right guy at the helm. And we have outstanding people who are, we being, again, my view of the government, they have outstanding people participating in it. So I think it's going to be, I think we're going to make great strides in, in this world with government and industry, because there's a recognition that this isn't an, an all or nothing world, right? There has to be understanding, compromise, and, and from the government perspective, only buying what we need and not, uh, not asking folks to reach beyond what we need and having a sensitivity to what it means to a particular company both financially and strategically when they're asked to give up their data rights. I'll just say real quickly, uh, thank you to George Mason for, for setting up this webinar. Uh, and I think in, in, a, in the nutshell, um, being able to have discussions like this on a more routine basis all the time and recognizing that sometimes it's going to be hard. Uh, a, a lot of people know uh, I have a certain marriage counselor, a metaphor that I like to use about discussing IP rights in this scenario. Oh. I'll save that for the next webinar. Uh, but but uh, I'm looking forward to, to having those discussions and I really appreciate you uh, setting up this webinar. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. We, to all the panelists, we really appreciate you making the time to do this. And thanks for all the viewers for tuning in to this thing. Uh, we, uh, we only do this because we can get 150 people to actually listen to this <laughs> property in government procurement. But we are the Center for Government Contracts. So I'll just say, Jim, uh, uh, the paper I thought was excellent and uh, Let's, let's have more of these. And what, one of my thoughts was, uh, Richard, on these Pathfinder programs, what, do you, what would you think about um, enabling Jim or others to, to write business cases, um, not, not necessarily publish them while these Pathfinder programs are going on, but publishing something on each of them at the end. Oh, I mean, I, for the first thing I would say, Army's doing great, uh, great work on, on setting up these pathfinders and trying to tr identify best practices and learn lessons from that. And one of our challenges overall is figuring out how to take lessons learned and being able to propagate those throughout the, not only the DOD community, but industry so that we have a common framework. Uh, and frankly, one of the challenges I know we're going to be facing as we go forward is that if we get into some really, really creative uh, business arrangements, then just that creative business business arrangement is something that actually might be considered IP at some point. If we're going to have some challenges in how we discuss that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm open to anything uh, for specifically on the Pathfinder programs. I would reach out to our army uh, points of contact. Uh, they have a whole, a whole group that's working on this and, and explore what, what makes sense for them. We would love to work on that. I'd love to talk to talk. I've had a couple conversations with secretary Jetty's people about it. And I'd, I'd love to pursue that further. Uh, Kelly, Kelly, I think you're on mute. I also wanted to thank George Mason University for hosting the event today. This dialogue is always so great to have, um, especially in, you know, uh, in a COVID environment where we can't meet face to face. I think having these web based uh, sessions is really great. Um, I I did want to put a plug for the Aerospace Industries Association and NDIA because I know that they're both always interested in working with um, the department and um, certainly I'm sure they'd be interested in working with TMU to bring other industry voices to the table as well for these types of events. So um, Jim, I just wanted to let you know that I chair the AIAIP committee uh, right now. So if you wanted me to facilitate that dialogue, I could do that for you. That would be terrific. Thank you very much though. Well, all right, y'all, we're five minutes over. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. We're going to do IP again oh, soon. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jerry, for uh, for setting this up. I think it's been great. Great. It's great to see you all.